In order to run a simulation, there's a few requirements that need to be met. There needs to be a reason why to run a simulation, and technology has to reach the level of maturity required to run a simulation. In terms of computation, our current technology may not reach a point of enough power to run simulations, at least not in a realistic way. The current way a computer works are with transistors. The way computers have gotten faster over the years are by shrinking the transistors and putting more in the same amount of space. Unless you make a computer the size of the surface of the moon or something, which would also require a lot of power to run, it's more likely we would have to find a better alternative to the classic transistor computer chips that we use today. We'd also need to have software to run the simulation, which means we have to create mathematical equations for all the mechanics of our universe so it can then be computed in a computer. Rendering out everything would require an unrealistic amount of computation, so we would have to then create algorithms and optimizations that achieve the same results with less resources while also continuing to make it indistinguishable to the observers inside. Which begs the question, how are we going to simulate ourselves if we don't even know how the physics of this place work? I mean, come on, spooky action at a distance, dark matter, dark energy, heck, we don't even understand how gravity works. There's progress that definitely needs to be made in the understanding of our physics before we begin running simulations that include and rely on physics. Now, let's also think of it in terms of something else we don't understand, consciousness. We don't know how it works, and we don't know what's required for it. As we develop our understanding about these, we may discover something that prevents these things from being able to be computed. There could be many problems that are completely invisible right now until we reach them, and maybe those problems are such a hurdle that we don't get past them. This is kind of like the Dunning-Kruger effect. Many people are confident it's possible. How much knowledge do we actually have about the subject? There could be a breakthrough that totally drops the confidence and the ability. But say we get past them. We now enter the argument of why. Well, there's definitely commercial reasons why. Instead of going through a long process of testing a new drug, you could skip everything and just go straight to a simulated human body. You could run a simulation of a body, administer the drug, and view the results the drug has on the simulated body. Of course, humans differ. You can't just run a simulation of a single body, as a single body can't represent everybody. So this would be an individual process. You can run a simulation of the individual person and jack them up on all kinds of drugs. You're no longer limited to the moral or ethical limitations of this world, and you can create algorithms that can make adjustments to current drugs or even come up with completely new drugs. Creating completely personal medication for that individual instead of making a drug that hopefully works for 60% of the recipients. Now, these aren't simulations of worlds or anything, more like human models used for experimenting on. So it raises the question, would our morals be separated because they're digital and not physical? Is it moral to create a being capable of feelings and consciousness inside of a computer and torture it? In that case, if we're running a simulation of this world, by pulling the plug, how is it any different from killing 7.8 billion people? So either the beings running simulations either don't care, or they run the simulations with the inhabitants impaired so the beings inside aren't actually conscious. And as far as I know, we're conscious, right? Of course, this is all assuming we get to that point. The Fermi paradox is the lack of evidence for life elsewhere given the high estimation of their probability. The size of our universe is huge. Even though the conditions of Earth are rare, there should be many Earth-like planets that could develop life. The great filter in context to the Fermi paradox is that there's a step that every civilization gets to that acts as a filter. For example, in order for us to get to the point where we are right now, we had to get past several steps in our evolutionary path. If we didn't get past complex single cell life, we wouldn't be any step higher than that. We've obviously gotten past it, but maybe that's the step that's holding up every other planet with life. We don't know what step it is, but it could also be something that happens in our future. We're either the one in a million that passed the filter, or we haven't gotten there yet, in which case chances are bleak we'll pass it. There is one big problem we have right now that could prevent us from reaching that point. 
climate change. Our reliance on fossil fuels may be our demise, and our world is destined to die by an out of control greenhouse effect. What if every civilization goes through this, and this is the great filter? Using readily available resources, coal and other greenhouse emitting fuels, to push its technological advancements forward. As our world continues to warm up, crop yield will reduce, straining our food supply, which will result in an increase of war, poverty, and there's going to be straight up more uninhabitable areas of Earth. Pretty much every empire has collapsed. If our history is compiled of fallen empires, what makes this era any different? Throw in some weapons of mass destruction, and you've got yourself a recipe for self-causing extinction. But maybe this time is different, and technology is given the opportunity to continue progression towards the required maturity. Chances are we would enter the singularity when artificial intelligence surpasses humans before we reach simulation maturity. It could easily be the best thing to happen to us, but it also might end our existence. Say we create an AI with the cognitive ability of a human, but it has the ability to make self-improvements. The rate of improvement would be exponential, resulting in a cognitive ability hundreds or thousands of times that of a human. It would be like comparing a baby to an adult, and it's either going to help us, or it will see us as a threat to its existence and in self-preservation end everything that poses a threat to it, preventing us from running simulations. But then, I guess there's nothing preventing it from running simulations. Okay, but say we get past all that, we create simulations. What would be the purpose of them? Run simulations to predict the future? Maybe we have a few problems. Climate change 2.0, or the difficulty of interstellar travel with our current chemical rockets. Well, we could run a simulation of ourselves to see how in the future we solve those problems and steal their ideas. But why would we have to run a whole simulation for that? In this hypothetical time we're talking about, we have an AI with the combined knowledge of everything humans have done, learned, discovered, with a cognitive ability far superior than ours. Who's to say that the way I can predict that if I drop a metal ball over a plate, the ball will fall and break the plate, that an AI can't predict the future events and solutions as easily as I can predict the plate breaking. So just feed AI the problem. No need to create billions of people in a simulation and have the potential for ethical backlash from the public. The same problem could be solved with less effort and probably less computer resources by an AI. If we've reached the singularity where AIs have far superior thinking abilities than humans, why have humans inside of simulations do the work? Unless you run simulations before creating AI to see if AI will turn out good or bad. Hmm. Now there's obviously other reasons to run simulations besides stealing ideas from them. One of which is the idea that we can run an ancestor simulation of our past. You could see how the pyramids were built, what was up with the Jesus guy, and pretty much any other event with some historical significance. In theory, if we create an accurate simulation of ourselves, there's nothing stopping us from running the simulation in reverse. But that's assuming we have a 100% accurate simulation of ourselves. Every detail about our solar system has to be inputted into the system, which means every human, every animal, all the bacteria, viruses, building constructs, terrain, our moon, the other planets in our solar system, all asteroids, comets, meteoroids, space dust, all this also including temperatures, position, velocity, and for everything. This goes for running a simulation to see the past, but also the future. The more accurate the initial conditions are, the better the results are going to be. This really isn't possible. Technically, all the information is still here from the past, but we can't physically measure everything. So what are we going to input into the system? Are we just going to make guesses? If the initial conditions of the system are guesses, then the system isn't going to provide accurate data on the past or future. This is called the butterfly effect, which is commonly associated with the idea that a tornado is influenced by a distant butterfly flapping its wings from a few weeks earlier. Which is really just a description of how if the initial conditions input into a model are not completely accurate and accounted for, like not accounting for a butterfly flapping its wings from across the globe, it can significantly change the outcome of the whole system. Same for a simulation. 
For a while, it will remain generally accurate enough for a useful prediction of the next few days, but after a few weeks, become increasingly more inaccurate. To bring up another point, if we get past all this, and it's that appealing of an idea that we build a planet-sized computer, something capable of running millions, billions, or even trillions of simulations at once, before the computer turns on, it could kind of be seen as dead. You don't have to render out everything about it, only what's necessary for an observer to believe it's real, meaning the required resources to render it are still low enough that it remains realistic to render. But, of course, once you turn the computer on, you suddenly have something that requires the whole system to actively be rendered. Kind of like a self-observing entity. Once it's running, the algorithm that predicts what state the computer is in suddenly has a lot more to predict. You can't skip out on rendering parts of the system. The entire system as a whole is now required to be rendered, or at least all the parts making the calculations. So suddenly, it's like spawning in a billion entities in a video game. A computer the size of a planet is probably enough to significantly change the load on the computer running our simulation. So it's unrealistic to run a simulation of a civilization that has the ability to run that many simulations. <laughs> so I can't believe I'm saying ifs now. But if we get to that point, guys, guys, if we make it that far, I think we're the one. I think we're the base reality. That, or we're not living in a digital simulation, but instead simulated with actual matter. Maybe a technologically advanced enough civilization finds an isolated star system, gives the system initial conditions, and let time and reality do its thing. Which brings us to the final point, and this isn't a point against simulations. We are going to learn a lot about simulations as we begin getting closer and closer to the ability of running them, and then eventually having the ability to run them. Whether the things we learn about prevent us from running simulations, or just act as obstacles to make it a little harder, maybe through running simulations we learn how to do it in a lower dimension or with a different set of physics. It'd be fascinating to learn about alternate universes with a different set of physics, in which case we can look at our simulations, look at ourselves, and then if we're in a simulation, potentially learn more about the people running our simulation. If our simulations end up pretty much as a copy of our universe, maybe that means that if we're in a simulation, our simulators have a lot in common with us. If we run simulations, we get two data points. We don't just learn what's capable inside of a simulation, but we also learn what's possible outside of one. Maybe as we run simulations, we discover bugs in it that transfer over to our reality. Looking at it in that kind of a way, we could potentially patch those bugs and glitches and then end up running a simulation with a more realistic set of physics than our own.